uh, James R. Garfield, and as president of the Major Village Library Association, I welcome all of you to our 1909 fall meeting. <laughs> it happened that today, November 19th, would have been my father's 79th birthday. And I do not think it likely that I would be standing before you were it not for his continuing influence. This being the occasion also of our 25th year as an organization, I thought it proper to review briefly the history of our library in Metro. And to assist me in this review, I have invited my little mother to join us this evening. And I hope you will join me in welcoming her as I bring her to the front of the room. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I do have the great pleasure of introducing to you my little mother, Mrs. Lucretia Garfield. Well, thank you very much, Jim. I am so pleased to have been included in this event this evening, this special meeting with many of our friends and neighbors surrounding us here in the audience. Uh, the evening is special to us, celebrating the library's 25th organizational anniversary. And I want to thank your lovely wife, Helen, for sending along the last flowers <laughs> of her rose garden uh, for this year. Aren't they year lovely? In <laughs> honor of your father's birthday. Helen has such a green thumb. She's kept these going all the way into late November. Yes. <laughs> she, she is really something as, as a gardener, is she not? She is. Yes. All right. Did you want to take a seat, Mother? I think I will. Thank right. you. I have in remembrance credited my father for my success in life, but I must also give credit where credit is due. For as I once wrote to Helen, my mother has made all that is good in me. Oh my, you are a dear old fellow. <laughs> I'm so proud to be here with you as the president of this organization. For when Jim was a young boy, he was known as our moody child. <laughs> Mr. Garfield and I never knew which Jim we were going to encounter on any given morning. <laughs> Was he going to be the happy-go-lucky young man who willingly did his school assignments? Or was he going to be crabbed and grouchy and sullen? Out of sorts. Out of sorts. He was often a handful, very difficult to manage from mo one moment to the next. But here he is today standing before you. He is an accomplished attorney with his brother Hal. They have a law firm in Cleveland, and he has just completed a very heavy responsibility as the Secretary of the Interior in President Theodore Roosevelt's cabinet. So I'm thinking back to those days when you did not like to read, when you did not like to study and do schoolwork, and I'm amazed at how he has turned out. <laughs> it's true. I didn't like school at all. I was interested in the out of doors, in football, in baseball when I was a youth. Uh, recently, I've taken up tennis, and I find I had a great passion for it. But in sum, I was not the scholar that my mother or my father were. But they were determined that their children would be introduced to the world of books, to Shakespeare, in the form of Charles and Mary Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare. This is a prose version of all the stories of the plays. Then there was Dickens, there was Thackeray, there were the ancient Greeks and Romans, their tales, some of which could be quite harrowing. There was one, Iphigenia in Aulis, uh, by the Greek poet Euripides. Frightened Jim so, uh, Jim, frightened Hal so badly that he went to bed crying. And I remember Father entering our room to console him, to calm him down so that he could get to sleep. 
it was quite a moment. But those were the kinds of things that our parents introduced us to. The ancient Romans, the Greeks, the Shakespeare, Dickens, Jane Austen, and so forth. And then there were poets. Longfellow. And father's favorite, Tennyson. Tennyson. Yes. Bring out, out the old. Ring in the new. Ring, ring happy, happy bells across the snow. The year is, is going. Let him go. Ring out the false. Ring, ring in the true. true. Yes, that was your father's favorite poet, Alfred Lord Tennyson. And my husband took those words and put a little tune with it that he composed. And our family has traditionally sung that tune every year in the Christmas season, between Christmas and New Year's. And it goes back to when my husband was a young boy. He was quite a reader. He devoured books as many as he could get a hold of. He especially liked adventure stories. His favorite? The Pirate's Own Book. For you see, James Garfield thought he was going to grow up to be a sailor one day and ride in those wonderful masted ships across the ocean and have all the adventures that he read about in those books. Well, I love to read too. In fact, literature is one of the things that brought James Garfield and me together. I have to agree with former President Thomas Jefferson who said, I cannot live without books. For it would be of as much use to stop breathing as to let books alone if they are anywhere in the near vicinity of me. <laughs> and so reading was one of those things that, that brought Mr. Garfield and me together. And you know, when he traveled as a congressman representing our 19th district here in Ohio, we often set up a mutual reading time every evening. We would select a book before he left town. And then at the appointed hour, we would each read from that book. Mutual reading, but miles apart. <laughs> he even did this with his mother. They would choose Bible verses and, and read at the same hour every day and share that, even though they were at a distance. And do you remember your father writing while he was traveling? I thought that's what you were going to mention just now. Father would, take, would, would write to us and tell us where he was going across the country, town to town, city to city, and he would take down, you would take down, yes. the atlas. The large atlas. The large atlas and lay it on the floor for Hal and Molly and Irv and Ada and me to look at, to trace Father's route across the country so we could see when he was in Montana. We could see when he was in San Francisco. And, of course, he would write to us, and he would tell us about his experiences in these communities. But this was another way for us to be introduced to a different kind of reading, but certainly reading and intellectual stimulation, intellectual growth, by tracing his route on the Atlas pages. It was a wonderful thing to do. It was. And Mr. Spofford, the librarian at the Library of Congress, oh, yes. told me that my husband and one other congressman were the two gentlemen who took the most books out of the Library of Congress, for your father was known to get down to the bottom of a subject, and he would leave the Library of Congress with a stack of books on his subject matter in any area that he was working on in legislation and such. When, when we were in Washington, when father was in, in Congress, when Congress was in the session, he often took Hal and me with him uh, to the Capitol, to the library, and we met Mr. Spofford, we saw all the books that he was exploring, and Father was just so good to, especially Howe and me, because we were the oldest, and he could they relate. They were like three bachelors. Yes, he could relate <laughs> what he was doing to us more easily. And so we got to see just how he went about his work, the study that he put into any subject that he was uh, involved in, politically speaking. He needed to research various issues. And so this was one of the ways he did it, by going to the Library of Congress, by exploring those books. And I'm sure that some of you here tonight read along in the newspapers during that front porch campaign that took place not too far from here, oh, about 30 years mm -hmm. ago now. 1880. Uh, in the newspapers, the reporters said that the Garfields had books 
everywhere. They were stacked up on tables, piled up on the floor, overflowing our bookcases. There were books everywhere. That's true. Books were everywhere. In fact, there was a small building on the farm, a uh, tenant quarters, uh, and Father converted that into his library in the very first year we were on the farm, in 1877. We moved there in that spring, and he converted that little building into his library. Well, that little library then became his campaign office in 1880, and the books were still there, but of course, so were the reporters, so were the people who were helping him to manage the campaign. Mm -hmm. So my family's habit of reading really inspired the way my life has progressed up to this time. And so after I was elected to the village council in 1888, I took up Mother's suggestion that it would be a great benefit to the community of Mentor, to the village of Mentor, to have its own free library for the intellectual stimulation of all citizens. But of course, you may be wondering what it is when I say a free library. Because this was Mother's idea, I'd like Mother to explain it to you. Well, in order to understand and appreciate what we have today, we have to look back at what came before. When my family moved here and purchased our farm in the fall of 1876, there was a subscription library here in Mentor. And I was told that the earliest one had started way back in 1819. But by the time we were here in the 1870s, if you could read and you could afford to pay the annual fine, you could borrow books. It was a subscription library. And the books were a community-held batch of books, 50 or 60, uh, of a serious nature, more than fun reading. I would say there were some political tomes and there were histories and biographies, a few religious books, uh, some weighty novels. But one had to go to a residence in order to borrow the books because the books were housed in someone's home. Now, as one of the earliest caretaking families, the earliest librarians of these books, were the Loomis family. Miss Mary Loomis was an educator herself. She loved children. She loved reading. So she acted much as a librarian in her father's house. You, you may remember this house. You go past it today. Yeah, you can still the see OL it right there Lewis on Metter House. Avenue. There it is. Some of you may remember, yes, I hear you, as the Corning House. That's right. It was the Corning House before the Lewis's. built for Nathan Corning Jr., Yes, as I recall. Yes. And so you had to go to that house in order to borrow books. Now, woe be it if you returned a book with dog-eared pages. <laughs> or worse yet, if you didn't return the book at all, because there were hefty fines that were levied to keep everyone honest and to keep the books in nice shape. It was very important with the subscription library to do that. But my idea was to create a free library so that anyone in the village could borrow books. And that would open up this area and to be more educated, more enlightened, and to be able to enjoy what reading has to offer. That's true. So this was Mother's idea. And it was an idea that obviously I shared with her, but also other members of this community, of this village. People whom you know, people whom you knew, names that you might recognize today as you travel the streets of our village. The Murrays, the Harts, the Tylers. Mm -hmm. and there were also the Blishes, uh, the Morleys, and several other uh, members of the community who worked with me very closely to get our library established. I viewed a free, non-subscription library as a worthy goal for this village, one that could be made a reality when everyone here worked together for the public good. And I saw the library as a public good. Our schools 
we're introducing our youths to the wonders of books. And it seemed to me that having the free library where those students could now come to partake of much more than had been previously offered would be a very, very good thing for this community. We benefit every child in mentor and every child's parent. But how? How to accomplish this goal? And the goal was twofold. To create a larger library with a broader spectrum of material to be borrowed freely, but also to get away from the idea of borrowing books by going to a private residence. In other words, how to create, how to have built a public library building where not only could you borrow the books, but there would be space in that building for reading, for study, for intellectual development or amusement. Now, at this time, in the 1890s, there were people in the community who didn't support us. You know it is human nature. It is human nature to doubt that something new is going to be of benefit. And, and there were naysayers here in Mentor in the 1890s who would say, oh, you've tried it before and it didn't work and it won't work this time. But Mother and I and all the people that, whom I've mentioned who are in support of this idea, we persevered. We persevered so that this library could become a reality. That's right. The committee who elected Jim unanimously as their president was steadfast in their work. In spite of all the naysayers and the people who said that it would fail, they knew that they had to plod forward and try to make this a reality. And in order to raise money to pay a librarian's salary, to purchase more books, to pay for the expenses that go with owning your own public building, we had to come up with a way to raise some money. And our first idea was entertainment. That's right, entertainment. <laughs> we would have a series of lectures, some plays, some musical offerings. We even held a spelling bee mm -hmm. and had an inexpensive admittance fee and people would come and enjoy themselves. And that's how we started to raise money for our own library. That's right. And these entertainments were held on the first floor of the Village Hall, which was built in 1888, just, just brand new building in 1888, the Village Hall. We would have our entertainment there. Now, some of the lectures were well attended. Mother is showing you. If you don't know our Village Hall, there it is. Some of our lectures were well attended. Some had to be canceled for lack of interest or perhaps something happened to one of the presenters and he or she could not keep that engagement. But we persevered, as we said before. And something else I knew by talking to many people in our village, particularly the ladies of the village, there was a great deal of support among you ladies for this idea of a free non-subscription library. And I even wrote uh, at one point to, to Helen, before she was my wife, while she was still in Chicago, I wrote to her that I favored giving women in, in the village the right to vote on village affairs. Now I knew that that was going to be very controversial with a lot of the men in the village, particularly <laughs> a lot of the Republican men in the village. But being a Republican myself, I stuck my neck out and I said I would support having women vote on an issue like the creation of our free non-subscription library. All right. Yes, the committee had quite a deal of support from my entire family. That's true. My Aunt Liddy was my vice president for a time. And she and my uncle Joe at these entertainments they would hand out the, they would rather sell the tickets, and they would also give out the refreshments mm -hmm. during those those uh, evenings. 
My brother-in-law, Joe Stanley Brown, gave a lecture about his travels in a lecture in, in Alaska. You see, he is a geologist, and he had recently gone to Alaska, and he was giving a lecture about the seal fisheries there. The Painesville Telegraph noted at the time that it was to be illustrated with a magic lantern. And, of course, it will be all the more interesting that Mr. Brown has just come from Alaska himself. Yes, the Pribilof Island, studying right. the seals there. That's right. My sister Molly, very interested in artistic endeavors, in theatrics and so forth, organized a very successful stage play in which she played a leading part. It was called The Sleeping Car. The Sleeping Car, car yes. It was a melodrama, and it was very <laughs> successful. It was a success indeed. It raised over $107. The community loved it. Mm -hmm. Then there was a cake auction. The I, cake auction. This, I, this Mother was knows the best about this. story. This was the best. I'd like to quote a letter that I wrote to Helen. Again, she was not yet my wife. But I wrote her a letter. And in that letter, I told her about the cake auction in April of 1891. And I begin the letter with these words. You will certainly have to come home, or else our pockets will be very empty. Last night, the library reception was a great success. The grab bag caused a lot of fun, the only trouble being that there were more tickets sold than there were packages. However, everyone was happy and enjoyed the evening. Aunt Liddy and Nettie King presided at the coffee and tea tables. Your friends all wished for your presence. But now for my extravagance. <laughs> a cake was put up at auction, and I modestly bid 17 cents. <laughs> then 19 cents. Then 25 cents. <coughs> Mr. Gulliford and I found ourselves rival bidders. And after a good deal of laughter and fun, I got the cake for $11. <laughs> I was obliged to give a note for $10, because I only had one with me. <laughs> Mr. Gallifern endorsed the note to the auctioneer, who demanded security. And then Mr. Gallifern said that he would give the library his highest bid of $10, so you see, the board got $21 for the cake. <laughs> that was a fun evening. It was a wonderful yes. evening. The way that turned out was quite something. Now let's see. There was the cake au auction, and then in December of 1889, a couple of years before, I recall that there were some young ladies girls from the Painesville Seminary who were going to perform at our Christmas fair. Now, of course, that seminary became, just a couple of years ago, Lake Erie College. So we had even had the girls from Painesville, from the seminary then, helping to create a library, a free library, here in Menor. All through the years, mother's support was vital and it was reassuring. It was Mother who purchased an upright piano to be placed in the village hall for all the various musical entertainments that we were able to secure there. And it was also Mother who donated books and got several of her friends involved as well. So I'll let her tell you about that. Well, we needed books. And I enlisted the help of my friends in Washington, because Mr. Garfield and I were in a literary society there in Mrs. Dahlgren's house. It was the first book club that we were ever part of. And I knew that I could count on those ladies' support in sending books here for us. Now, I also hosted dime socials at our Menor Farm. So you folks all came very nicely with your dimes and had refreshments and a little visit with all your friends in, in the area. 
I remember some of these folks yes, at those yes. time circles. They, they were very supportive. In fact, I remember some of them in 1880, yeah. <laughs> well, I won't go that far. But, but the dime socials were very successful, held in my parlor. And then I asked some of the ladies from the miscellany club to join me and to assist in providing books and things. And the miscellany club, some of you are members of that. Molly and I started that in 1898. She's the one who came up with the idea for the club. She thought miscellany wouldn't tie us down to anything in particular, but it was basically a literary society for the ladies here in Lake County. And we kept the organization small so that we could continue to take turns meeting in each other's parlors. Every year we have a theme, like the American Revolution or patriotism. Each lady writes a paper on that subject and then is expected to present at one of the meetings. And so I knew those ladies could be counted on to also assist us in providing some books. And it occurs to me, just listening to Mother speak again about the miscellany club, the idea that any group of citizens would go to a private home to engage in some kind of intellectual activity, very, very common 30, 40 years ago, Mostly 50 years men's ago. groups, though, well, I have to tell you, Jim. Well, that is mostly true. Mostly the men's groups, but then we ladies caught up. <laughs> but this idea, this idea that one would go to a private home for a lecture, for a debate, or to borrow books. And while it may still be quite fashionable and quite useful to have these gatherings of citizens in private homes to discuss the matters of the day, or to engage in some sort of intellectual stimulation, or something that's just plainly fun, still we come back to the idea that perhaps the time when one would go to a private home for books had passed. And it was time now to think about a public space where books could be preserved, where they could be borrowed, and where one could read. So, by April of 1890, it was time to house the books that the association had been able to purchase in their new but temporary home, the second floor of the Village Hall. Mm -hmm. And I clearly remember Mrs. Mina Corning and your, and I setting up the books on the bookshelves on the second floor of the Village Hall in April of 1890. It took us several days. Now, the fundraisers, yes, they had accomplished a purpose. They had allowed us to acquire more books for the people of the village. But the ultimate goal of building a public space with a reading room could not be accomplished simply through the gathering of funds from the entertainments. Something more needed to be done. Now, you may be thinking that this idea of a free public library mentor was a isolated idea just here in the community of Metro, but in fact this was an idea that was very popular throughout the state of Ohio as well as throughout the country. So there was a need for free libraries throughout the state of Ohio. And the state legislature came to our rescue, if you will, in 1895. We were permitted by the legislature not just mentor, but villages all and townships all around the state were permitted to charge some sort of a tax on the citizenry for the support of a library. And that year of 1895, the village council, I was still on it, passed a one-half mill tax for all property of $1,000 or more. So for every $1,000, a half mill or a half cent, let us say, to support the library. So again, we have now a regular kind of fund for the purchasing of books and for taking care of whatever expenses are involved in salaries, utilities, protecting the books, cataloging them. All of that was accomplished through the entertainments and through the levying of this tax. But 
Still, that would not be enough to allow us to build a building. And we were fortunate in that there were citizens in our village, past and present, who wished to see us accomplish that goal. Yes, I'm thinking of Addison Goodall. Mr. Goodall, yes. In 1899, Mr. Goodall, Goodell, Goodell, I should pronounce Goodell. it correctly, mm -hmm. who was from Mentor, grew up here, and then at that point was living in Illinois, offered to give us $1,500 to $2,000 towards a building. A couple years later, Dr. Luce, you all remember Dr. Lucy was our coroner at one time in the 1870s, and even our postmaster in West Mentor for a while. Mr. Andrew. Oh, oh, I'm no, sorry. Mr. Dr. Luce. Dr. Luce, Dr. you're Dr. right. Luce. I was thinking of Mr. Andrew, but you're right, Dr. Luce. Dr. Luce had the post office right in his doctor's shop. <laughs> but Dr. Luce offered to sell his parcel of land at the northeast corner of Center Street and Mentor Avenue almost the exact center of the village and the township. And he offered this. We thought this is the perfect place. It would be accessible for all people in our area to get there very easily. There it is. I just want to point out Convenient this for everyone, wouldn't you say? I would. I would like to point out this building and tell you that this is our library, of course. Sitting when on that it was corner. New, when it was new, sitting at the corner of Center Street and Lender Avenue. Now, in our little discussion this evening, Mother and I have talked a great deal about the various members of our family who supported our efforts. Aunt Lydie, Uncle Joe, my brother-in-law, Joe Stanley Brown, my sister Molly. But there's yet another member of the family, in addition to Mother, who helped us create our library, who helped that building, this building, become a reality. And he is my brother, Abe. Yes, he's the architect in the family. I'm proud to say that he went to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he's the one who designed our first library building. A two-story structure in the federal style, and he donated his labor. So again, a gift to this community. Many of you will recall, I'm sure, the joyous spirit that possessed us all on May 31st, 1903, as Abe's building was dedicated, the long-planned goal of a free library located in a public space, not in a private home, with a room for books and also a room for quiet reading and study was now a reality. Abe's labors freely given, Mr. Goodell's donation, Dr. Luce's donation, the contributions of some other prominent citizens made our library a reality. When the new building opened just a few years ago, you'll recall our hours were limited. If you recall, Tuesday afternoons, 3 to 5, Friday evenings, 6 to 8. But now, with the recently installed acetylene gas plant, we are hoping to be able to extend the hours that the library will be open to all of you. Yes, and since that time, our Mrs. Angier, our first librarian, had to retire due to poor health. And so that sent us on a search for a new permanent librarian. And we came across Miss Frances Cleveland, very educated, learned woman from this area. She was even in the miscellany club, came very highly recommended. And so we hired Miss Cleveland as our new full-time permanent librarian. 
And she was very resourceful, very dedicated woman. She even built shelves with her own hands. In cold, in a cold building. In a cold, cold building and carted them by cart to mm -hmm. places mm -hmm. because she took books out into the community to the schools. So That's she true. took those shelves there. Yes. Then she also She's still doing it. Cataloged <laughs> the books. Now isn't that a wonderful idea? Cataloging the books. Rather revolutionary idea, but she did it. Yes, so now we have an exacting list of what we have and what's coming and going here at the library. She also recently came up with a wonderful idea, a story hour for our youngest patrons, mm -hmm. enlisting them into hearing stories that could make their imaginations grow and maybe take them off to distant places or to meet historical yes, figures. Yes, meet famous people or learn ideas old and new. Um, I think she has many, many ideas that will help this library grow. She is a dedicated public servant. And I would say that your speech, Jim, on that day of our dedication in May of 1903 sums up all the efforts that were made to bring it to reality. I think that's a cue. So, <laughs> what I said at that time was this. The time when finally we determined to petition the village council for a small levy of one half mil, we felt to breathe more freely and to aspire toward a library building of our own. It was probable, however, that had not Mr. Goodell come to our aid it would have been a long time, if ever, that we could have had as good a building as we now have. We drew up plans, and the work progressed. And here we are tonight with thankful hearts under our own library roof. It was a proud day. Proud day indeed. And so now, ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for allowing us, Mother and I, to review with you the history of our Mentor Free Library. And if at this time you have any questions, we would be happy to entertain them. Involved in the pay library, take the idea of a free library. Well, there was quite a bit of resistance at first. I'm not sure if um, there was a snobbishness. Some folks felt that the village was the snobby folks and the township, the more rural folks. And I think that maybe the subscription people thought, oh, we want to keep this idea to ourselves a little longer. But we knew, our family knew what reading did, how it opened up doors, how it opened up your imagination. So it, it was our intention to almost force it upon them. Don't you think? We knew it. Well, I don't know that I would say that, Mother, but... We knew it would be good. It would be good for them. Well, that's true. Has it been good for you to have your own free library? Yes. Yes, indeed, I think so. Yes. I know that gentleman will agree. <laughs> I'm a touch biased, but yes. <laughs> Other questions, ladies and gentlemen? On anything. It doesn't have to be about the library. You can ask about Jim's private life. It's quite interesting. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Mother. I'm trying to remember. Is that picture of the old library taken in its present site, or where it was in Center Street? This is Center uh, Street and Menor Avenue. Oh. This is the building we're in, madam. <laughs> Do you know somebody we don't know? Yes. Right here at the corner of Century and Mentor. Yes. I just wasn't sure where that picture was taken because I, I remember it being there. I just don't remember. There are stores to the east of it. There were stores to the east of it. Very good. And right across the street, Snell's Grocery. Do you remember? Yeah, a wonderful well, place. I remember. Yes. Oh, well, and that was, too. that was diagonal. Mm -hmm. Diagonal. You have an excellent memory, yes. No, yes. oh, I'm just old. Yes, sir. <laughs> You're old. What do you think about us? Anyway. 
has the levy actually supported the library for the last six years? Well, it has certainly it has supported the operational expenses. Yes. These last six years, yes, that levy has supported the operational expenses. Of course, we also do accept donations. So between donations and the levy, yes, so far we're doing we're doing fine. So with the paid librarian, uh, uh, what's a dollar a week, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, but did the hours become longer then? Well, we haven't decided yet exactly how we're going to extend the hours or when we're going to extend the hours. But with that new acetylene gas plant, we know that we will be able to do just that. So, and Miss Cleveland was telling me the other mm, day she's even looking ahead to the future for electric that's lights. That's true. That is, we have more that about electricity, <laughs> electricity in the building. Lights here. Yes. And so. then we don't have to worry about sundown mm -hmm. and shortened daylight in the winters. We can have the library available more frequently? So the answer to your question is we haven't arrived at a decision yet. So thank you for the question. But we hope you'll show up at future meetings and put that idea across for us. How many people were living in the village at that time? Do you know? Oh, roughly? yes. Um, in, in that period, uh, it was, uh, what, a few years ago? A thousand or so in the village. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's surrounded by the township, right. so there's additional several folks. thousand more. Yes, yes. yes I'm, I'm quite poor on, on arithmetic. From the genesis of the thoughts of a uh, free, quote unquote, uh, library to the actual opening of the door, how long did that actually take? Well, we began our efforts in 1889. <clears throat> 1889, late 1888. And let's say 1889, and so then it took another, it took 14 years right. for our building to for be the dedication 14 and years. Having a, but how 14 long years of dedication. Brick and mortar building. Mm -hmm. But up until that time, when was it that you actually opened the free library in the second floor of the town hall? Oh, 1890. 1890. 1890. Okay. So, the, so the collection of books. Village hall was housed. Yes, in the village hall on the second floor in 1890. But 14 years from the idea to the fruition of that building. That's not too terribly long in, in a lifetime. I've seen a lot of things, you know, and that's one of those that <coughs> seemed to take a little while, but then it got the momentum. But it was worthwhile as well. I think we will all agree it was worthwhile. I saw a hand here, and then I see a hand there. I just want to ask, um, on you personally, <laughs> Oh, when did you propose I, to oh, Ellen? I, I, yes. Well, I'm just saying it loudly enough so the oh. folks up here can hear too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I like this story. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to tell too much, but it was in April of 1889 that I proposed to Helen, and we were married on December 30th, 1890. So, in Chicago, mm -hmm. it was a grand wedding, lots of red and green, and some prominent railroad people attending. Helen's father, president of the, of the, of the uh, railroad. Lake, Lakeshore, Michigan Lake Southern. Lakeshore, Michigan yes. Southern Railroad. Yes. 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 Did the Garfield family contribute their own personal books to the library? Some. Yes, I did donate books to start that off. Yes, yes. But we, but mother still has her collection of books. My father's library at her home, and the then of course I had my own personal collection of books as well. We were modest, but also there were four families, I believe, that backed the remaining money oh, that yes. we needed mm -hmm. to construct this building mm -hmm. and to really get it going. So. The Garfield family was one of them. The Murrays, the Blishes, and um, I want to say it was the Hearts, who... Along with us. Yes. That backed the balance that was needed to finish the project That's until right. we could get the money from the tax and such. Yes. yes. And another question in regards to parking. Did, was there, uh, like, behind the building for buggies and that kind of thing that people could park, or was there a lot of foot traffic? I would say foot traffic is the majority of the traffic that visits the library. And, and Don't forget, we have the interurban mm -hmm. 
<laughs> it's going down the south side of Menor Avenue starting 1896. That's right, 1896. My home is stop 55. Mm -hmm. And you could take that very easily. That's not an invitation. <laughs> you can take that very easily and get off by Snell's Grocery and across the road. Mm -hmm. oh, and come to the library if you don't want to leave a vehicle. Of course, we're into horseless carriages now, 1909, aren't we not? Yes, we are. Yeah, a lot has changed here in the city. Yes. I'm interested to know how one would check out a book. It would just be a big record and we'd write. Yes, there would be a, there's a book and you... Sign you, it out. Yes. The name of the book is written down. The name of the person who's borrowing the book is written down. The date of return is written down and a receipt is given for that book to that person with that date. And you had it for two weeks. <laughs> and you can extend it for another week. Did they have a library card? No. Does the ledger exist still? Those ledgers? Do the ledgers exist? You know, I don't know. I haven't kept up with that. I'm sorry. I, I don't I, remember anything past 1918, so I <laughs> cannot help with this answer. Well, given it's 1909, you've got a few years to go. <laughs> The ledgers are still here now, but I don't know what happens in the future. That's up to you, Jim. That's your responsibility, is it not? Yes, sir. What was the penalty for a late return of a forfeit? Ah. Was there one? Yes, there was. Oh, there was a penalty. Oh, yes, there was. Quite hefty early on. I think it was $2.50. That sounds right. Oh, wow. Wow. Whoa. So you treated your books with respect. You didn't yeah, sure bend did. over the corners. And with that in mind, Jim and I brought bookmarks for you for this evening. You may take one on your way out. That way you won't have to dog ear your pages any longer. Was there another question? Did I say anything? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I understand that the foot traffic and stuff would be, you know, from within the city, from within the village. Mm -hmm. But your outlying areas, how how would they have access? library through well they would they would have come in th their conveyances no doubt most of them would have come in their conveyances and, okay. and parked their conveyances on the street i was so mm -hmm. pleased to see folks from kirkland and from paynesville mm -hmm. and you know other areas in the county even come to us now there is no fee for uh, residents of mentor to borrow books but for outlying areas there is a charge uh it's as i, as I recall it is a Dollar twenty-five. I'll check with Miss Cleveland. I think it's a dollar twenty-five a year for non-residents of Mentor. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Did downtown Cleveland have a library of its own? Oh, I think yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. So, is Mentor's the only free library in Lake County? Oh no, no, no. Oh, but we, I think we were before the Morley Library, were say, we not? Yes, the, uh, this, library, yes this library predates Mr. Morley's library in Paintsville, but you see, he had the same idea for Paintsville. So, no, there are free libraries throughout Lake County. Did some of the influence for the free libraries come to, uh, through Andrew Carnegie when he started the free library system? Well, I don't know that I would draw a direct connection between what Mr. Carnegie uh, is uh, attempting to do and what we've done here. I think that you could probably say that Mr. Carnegie, the citizens of Mentor, the citizens and villages and townships around the country all recognize the fact that we are becoming a more educated, a more literate society. And people want reading material. They, they desire to explore ideas. They desire to explore places that they may not ever themselves visit physically, but they can visit them through the wonders of books. They can meet people through books. And so a literate society, a society that is looking for knowledge as well as entertainment, these are the things that I think, these are the ideas that have promoted the creation, not only of Mr. Carnegie's libraries, but also a library like ours here in Mentor. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, speaking of literacy, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the people
people that weren't literate, that didn't, weren't able to read as you were growing up, was there like a reading class or anything like that for the people in the library? We have not established such a program, but I think that that's a very uh, laudable idea, particularly for adults who are no longer of yes. school age. Yes. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, again, we have a robust uh, school system here in Mentor, and so we have youths who from very early on are learning to enjoy uh, and to decipher the printed word and to, uh, to be able to benefit from books and from reading. Yes. We'll have to pass on that notion to Miss Cleveland. That's she a, could make that happen. That's a very good idea. So thank you. Was it sent, did Center Street School in that same time period as the library? So you know, they talk to us as if this is long, long ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't quite understand. Do you understand this? Or no. no. But the school was right near yeah. the village just, hall. Just a little right. child. Just a, <laughs> well, that explains it. All right. She's much too young. She's much too young. Know. So yes, the village school. Actually, you know, my brothers Irv and Abe went to walked, the village school. Well, from our home to the village school there during that front porch campaign yes, in 1880. Right. They so, walked from our manor farm to the village school. So the library is right located here on the northeast corner. The school's on the northwest corner, mm -hmm. right across the street. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ideal too, I think. Uh, then and now, how does the library procure you books? I mean, like, I never gave it a thought, but all these authors and stuff, how does the library? Mm -hmm. Well, Jim, if we can look in the future, I think I would ask Sue Fran <laughs> how the modern library procures books. Well, we take suggestions from our patrons of books that they're looking for. Um, we notice what the community reads. And from there, we come up with a list of things that we're going to purchase. I was going to say simply we buy them, but that's <laughs> her answer is a little bit more detailed. Same answer, also yes, we buy them. <laughs> Sometimes they're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Does your library also have periodicals and newspapers? It's not my library, it's your library. It's <laughs> our library. The reference materials are yes. quite popular. Yes, they and are. And Miss Cleveland, Cleveland <laughs> takes those out to the schools, mm -hmm. and the children love them. Reference materials. Right. So, yes, newspapers, a must. A must in a public library. Yes. Because of the uh, summer times and uh, a lot of people travel to the suburbs way out to get away from all the smog in the cities. You mean they, they came would, here? They, they would come here. Mm -hmm. They would find there was an influx. Do you find an influx? library visit, visit, visiting and um, some of the books possibly that came oh. to the mentor traveled far away came from Cleveland oh, area oh, oh. I, I you know I need to consult with Cleveland about that but I have no doubt that we do have donations from as far away as Cleveland and itself. the cottages are very mm -hmm. popular in the mm -hmm. summer down closer to the lake, and so we do have an influx of people. And so we yes, and even and so, within our own family, we have folks that come out for the summer. So Your right. brother-in-law is mm -hmm. John Newell's right next door to that's, you there. That's right, and it's his summer home. Well, I think your point is well taken. That in the summer months, when children aren't in school, when we have people coming in from Cleveland, from <laughs> um, yes, we see a greater business in our library. Greater use of the materials that I we have to Cleveland's offer. I think Miss Cleveland's going to need volunteers. I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. Yes, one Do more. You have, since this is a, a meeting tonight, are you having in the works plans for fundraisers in the future? I haven't given that a thought, but. Should you write Something. that down for new business for the next meeting? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> You'll want to get her name. I sure will. Where <laughs> like am I going to get her name? <laughs> 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 she, has she has suggestions for us. Mm -hmm. You can 
and the meeting, if you would like. Well, there's one more question oh, I'm going to question. give to this lady. It has nothing to do with the library. Uh, right. Where do you live in Venter? Oh, I live in, at Hollycroft. You're not familiar oh, with Hollycroft. Do you not know of Jim's house? You know he no. built this house just 300 yards northwest of my lawn field home. And now my house is called the old house. And mine is the big house. <laughs> because he has 35 rooms. And she has 29. <laughs> and Helen has stenciled Holly around the upper walls mm -hmm. in the house. Mm -hmm. And lovely gardens. Yes. Helen is particularly fond of Holly. And for those of you who don't know this, our croft is a small specialty farm. It's a Scottish word. And so we combined her love of Holly with the idea that this would be her specialty. Uh, and so it is Holly Croft. And there's a tennis court? Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. President Roosevelt has played tennis on my tennis court. I have played tennis with President Roosevelt on my tennis. I was a member of President Roosevelt's tennis cabinet, as well as being. <laughs> How did you access your farm? Your farm from through the through. Well, there are several. You know, we have yeah. years ago. Well, about ten years ago now. Uh, 1900, 1901. Uh, mother hired, and you'll remember this better than I will. Mother, uh, mother hired a uh, landscape architect uh -huh. to design a series of paths and driveways and driveways that interconnected uh, the homes of not only mother and me, but also my brother-in-law that okay. Mother mentioned, John Newell, uh, and then also um, my brother Harry. So you were by the railroad tracks? Well, no. no I didn't say, no, 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 no. You weren't that far back. No, that's a good half mile away. Okay. Okay. But, um, but paths okay. and driveways. So once you come in off the avenue, Right. You can take a driveway from my house to Jim's house without mm -hmm. having to go back out onto Manor Avenue. Surely you've noticed the series of pillars along the road. Yeah. The stone yeah. pillars. Mm -hmm. Those mark the driveways and the path and the walking paths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm asking a personal question. Um, How personal? Your father, <laughs> <laughs> your father enjoyed farming. Did you enjoy it also? I, did enjoy I do enjoy farming. In fact, several years back, unfortunately, it didn't succeed. Uncle Joe, mother's brother, Uncle Joe and I invested in a farm in Kirtland, and we were raising uh, horses on the farm. It, it, it didn't financially work out for us, but it was a passion for both of us. Both Uncle Joe and I loved working with, with, the, um, with the horses, working on the farm. I enjoy taking walks through the woods in Kirtland, walking, of course, through the village, and all that it has to offer in terms of natural wonders here. Uh, so, yes, uh, farming was a, a, a passion of father, I would say, in his later yes. years. He didn't enjoy mm -hmm. it when he was a young no, boy. He didn't. <laughs> no, he didn't. But I have enjoyed farming, and we, we have done a great deal to maintain Mother's Farm all these years. You know, it's still operating. And improved the beef stock there. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. had some new breeds of cattle. And we're I still. Have to, I have to give mother a lot of credit for what she did. Oh, I give mother a great deal of credit. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice of you. Yes, Quick question. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you were in the news that your law office was in Cleveland. Yes. Uh, did you take the inner urban back and forth? Or yes. did you have a residence all, also in Cleveland? In, oh, <laughs> residence in Cleveland, but also <laughs> inner urban, and also, that. of course, took the train. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. And to the to the depot in Mentor. So I could I could use both. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. It seems like your father was president of the United States and you've worked in the cabinet with the Rosebud mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any interest in entering politics or going for a higher office? Oh, I see. You, you've forgotten. I was your state senator from 1896. <laughs> <laughs> but then again, well, you also... <laughs> well, you may, you may not be able to read, but you do look rather young. Too. You wouldn't remember that. He remembers that, but you would. <laughs> I was your state senator. I wanted to follow in Father's yeah. footsteps as a member of Congress. 
But the divisions within the Republican Party in the area were such that I was prevented from winning the nomination. Um, but I would also freely confess to you now, I'm looking back at my brief career in elective politics. I am not a person who enjoys, and you may have noticed this this evening, particularly um, speaking in public. I do not consider myself to be particularly adept at it. So the idea of campaigning uh, for an office, um, I find to be a bit unnatural for myself. But I also hold very, very strongly the view that there are good people, good men, in our society, broadly speaking, and certainly within our area, who can be, who should be, elected to public office because their goal is my goal, to serve the public good. So my forays into elective office uh, were brief in the 1890s. Uh, I will confess that now having served in President Roosevelt's cabinet, and knowing that in a few years there will be a new election for a new governor, uh, I have been solicited to possibly seek the Republican nomination for that office. Um, and of course the, the new progressive party, of which President Roosevelt uh, is seeming to be uh, very interested, has also uh, approached me as possibly its candidate for the office of governor, and I will confess that I am interested in the idea. So I may overcome my reluctance to campaign, and I may seek that office. Thank you, sir. One more question, and I think we will we will depart for the evening. This is addressed to your mother. What was it like to be the president's wife and live in the White House? It was highly intimidating, ma'am. Uh, as a naturally shy, reserved person, you can see where Jim gets it as mm -hmm. far as speaking in front of crowds, I did not want to be in the White House as the First Lady. Uh, but when my husband received the nomination, of course I wanted him to win. And I had been a congressman's wife for a number of years, and I know what the Washington Society is like, and what the reporters are like. And I knew they were going to watch every word I said, I did not want to make a mistake and embarrass your father. And there are certain social rituals, and I was fortunate that Mrs. Blaine took me under her wing. She had been in Washington a long time, knew all the rules, helped me decide on my days of uh, having the, the public come in and meet me. And so luckily, in the brief time that we were there, I did not really make any grand faux pas. <laughs> No, but uh, it was not my idea of uh, a very comfortable life in the executive mansion, in the public side. Nice to come home to your farm. Nice to come home to my farm. There were some uh, articles written about me that I was more at home in, in a library or in a parlor than I was out in a reception hall. Thank and you. that's true. As a board member, I would like to thank both of you for uh, spearheading the meeting tonight, and we will see you at the next meeting. Thank you very much.